Good morning, Bethel Church. Thank you, Carol, for sharing your heart with us and where we're headed as a church with the COVID-19 response. And I just want to make sure that all of our church family understands that whatever steps we take as we're allowed to take the steps moving forward, we will be diligent to do what is safest and best for each of our members. But ultimately, you have to make the decision and the choices that you know are best for you. So please be aware of that. Just because we, in the future, will be allowed to bring members back into the church, maybe you're not comfortable with that. Maybe that's not best for your health condition or your age, and that is your decision to make, and we honor that decision. And so please continue to encourage each other and continue to do what is best for you. I'm Pastor Drew. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday morning. I pray that you are doing well. I'm glad that we are coming to a close of the stay-at-home order. However that looks in the future, we will keep you posted as to what we will do to slowly, methodically, and safely bring people back to the church, whether it's a parking lot service um, or what have you. We will keep you informed. I'm glad that you're visiting with us. If you are a visitor for the first time, welcome to Bethel. And I pray that you'll be blessed by the hearing of the word. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 31. So while you find Luke 4, verse 31, um, I just want to say that we're going to be talking from the perspective or the subject that there is hope for the hurting. There is hope for the hurting. So Luke chapter 4, verse 31 begins this way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching? With authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the good news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the very fact that Jesus is our ever-present help in time of need. God, there is hope for the hurting because Jesus is on the scene and brings freedom and forgiveness. God, I pray today that you would minister to those who are hurting, those who may have messed up in life, those who may have found themselves in a situation where they see nowhere else to turn. Father, I'm thankful that today they have turned in to you and turned to you, Father. I pray today, Jesus, that you would give somebody the hope that they are so in desperate need of, and that is the freedom and the forgiveness, the love and the mercy and grace that comes only from Jesus Christ alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus has just gone through the wilderness experience with the enemy. The Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness and he spent 40 days and 40 nights battling the enemy and he became victorious, not because he won some battle, but because he is God and he is Lord and he is victorious. He has overcome death, hell, and the grave and he fought the enemy with who he was, the Son of God. And he used Scripture, the Word of God, which is the will of God, which is God's revelation to us that we might know who Jesus Christ is, that we might understand there's a God in heaven that loves you, that formed and fashioned you. Even before the world was, he knew you and he formed and fashioned you in your mother's womb. And he knows every hair on your head and he loves you so much that he died on the cross for you. And so if that doesn't put life into perspective, those of us who are hurting, those who, of us who have no hope today and may find themselves hopeless, know this, that Jesus Christ loves you and sees value and worth in you when connected to him. And that's why he went to the cross to fulfill his father's will 
to die for you that he might give you life and life eternal through the forgiveness of your sins by you trusting in him as your Lord and Savior by simple faith. And today that, that may sound amazing, it may sound hollow, but it's true. And for those of us who understand that life can throw us curveballs left and right, we understand when we see and touch the hands and feet of Jesus, when we hear his word and he ministers to us, we are so thankful that there is hope for the hurting. I remember early on in my Christian walk, I was hurting. I don't know about you today. Maybe some of you are hurting. Maybe some of you have just suppressed so much hurt that you don't even think about it anymore. And you begin, you muster through it. You smile through pain. Everything is okay, but yet you never want to get serious with anybody about what's going on behind the scenes because then they might see you for who you truly are. Hurting, broken, a shattered individual, living a life in a shattered marriage or a shattered career. Maybe there are some of you who are so broken and so hurting today that your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe it's coming to an end. Maybe your kids are, are doing things and that relationship is on the, the, the edge and soon to be over. Maybe you've done something in your career and you're now facing the consequences and you find yourself desperate and you find yourself searching and seeking for the hope but still afraid to tell people about what's going on because it may shatter the facade that you live behind well jesus wants us to understand in these passages that there is hope for the hurting it doesn't matter how in hiding you are jesus cares enough to come your way to give you the word or the revelation that will bring a hope and healing to your hurt but you have to be willing to get in front of Jesus. Early on in my marriage, early on in ministry, early on in life, I failed miserably and I thought I was at the end of my rope. I thought life was over at 30 years old. I thought it was done. But I got into a place called church, the church, not a building, but with the people of God. And I began to listen to the word of God spoken over me, the truth that sets me free, the truth that combats the lies and the, the, the fallacies of the enemy, the tricks of the enemy. I began to listen to the powerful word of God and it began to show me the right way to live, but it also began to show me how I could be forgiven of the sins that I've committed, though I may face the consequences. I found that I could be free from the sin that I was entangled to and that God would forgive me and give me life and life to the fullest through the power of his word and the Holy Spirit of God within me. And so as people began to flood me with the truth of the word, I began to see, you know what? There really is hope for the hurting. You just need to know where to go. You just have to understand that it's in the word of God. It should be in the churches of God. We should be preaching the word of God from the pulpits, not just some anecdotal stories about, you know, Ma and Pa Kettle and, you know, sitting down there by Possum Holler Creek and, and skipping rocks and how life is fun and, oh, the butterflies bring me joy and, hey, have a great day, dismiss. No, we need to be preaching the powerful word of God because in the word of God is hope for the hurting. And today many churches have abdicated their role of preaching and teaching the word of God. And so we have many people sitting in church overcome with depression, overcome with situations of hopelessness because they don't know which way to go because of decisions and choices they have made that haven't lined up with the Word of God because they haven't heard the Word of God. They haven't been challenged with the Word of God. And so they're hiding out in the pews, they're hiding out in the chairs, smiling through pain as if everything is okay, yet their marriages are falling apart, their families are, are in disarray, their lives are upside down, and they're just trying to survive each and every day, tormented by the enemy because desperate people will do desperate things. And today you may find yourself a desperate person who is doing desperate things. And maybe those desperate things are called sin, and you now have found yourself overcome with sin and despair. Well, I've got news for you today. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one can come to the Father except through him, right? But he is our hope. He is our peace. He is our joy. He wants to be your Lord and Savior. And he has a word for you today that he wants to scream to you. There is hope if you're hurting today. You don't have to hide out any longer. You just need to hear his word by getting in his presence. He's overcome death, hell, and the grave. He fought the enemy in the wilderness and he became victorious. Why? Just because he was the son of God? No, because he is the son of God, but he relied on the word of God as his ammunition to fight the enemy, the father of lies. He used truth to combat the enemy. And if we live by the truth, if we crucify our flesh and we clothe ourselves with Christ, with the word of God, we can be victorious. And that is our hope for those of you who are hurting. It's interesting. Jesus goes into church. And now when I was early on in ministry in my marriage, I failed miserably. I did. I got into things I shouldn't have gotten into. And the Lord arrested me. And I went to church. I went to the people of God. I went to the Word of God. And every day, every day, every day of the week, I wanted to be in the church because I wanted to hear the truth of God's Word. I wanted to hear people tell me the stories of how God got them through all of the situations in their life and how they were better now on the other side of the situation. Though it hurt going through it, they were better they were stronger their faith was stronger I wanted to be around God's people 24 7 and so I found myself going to church a lot to listen and to get that nugget of truth for the battle that I was going to face that day I would talk to ministers I would eat up Sunday services I'd eat up Wednesday Bible studies I would take notes left and right I'd highlight my Bible because the word is truth sanctify them by your word your word is truth Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, Jesus said. If we could just let that resonate in our, in our minds, in our hearts. Sanctify them. Cleanse them by the truth. Oh, Father, your word is truth. It's this that cleanses us. It's this that renews our mind. Do not be conformed to the patterns and images of this world any longer, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind you see it's a battle for the mind the enemy wants to keep you away from the word so that your mind cannot be renewed so that you fall into every trap that he has for you and so of course he wants to keep you out of the church but he doesn't mind if you go into church but don't hear the word of God and that's what was going on in Jesus's time and that's what's going on a lot around the world and so we're seeing churches not preach the word of God so people are fabricating or coming up with their own ideas Ideas of who God is. They're creating their own theology and putting God in a box to be their servant so they can live how they want to live. And we often find ourselves living how we want to live and justifying that God likes what we're doing because we have put God in this box because we're not in the Word of God. But the Word of God is sharper than any double edged sword. It'll pierce our hearts, it'll show us where we're wrong and how to live right. But the enemy doesn't want us in the Word. And so he doesn't mind if we go to church. He just doesn't want you to hear the word. And Jesus, right after his father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, the heavens were rent open, the spirit of God rested on him. He was led into the, the wilderness to fight the enemy and he became victorious and he used the word of God. He now is going around to preach the word of God to people who are in desperate need of hearing the word of God because they are in need of hope. Are you hurting today? There is hope today for you. If you are hurting, Jesus is on the scene and Jesus cares enough to come and seek you out. And today he is speaking directly to you that it's going to be all right. You may have fallen, you may have messed up, but with Jesus on the scene and with Jesus as the center of your life, it will be okay. It might not be an easy road. It might not be the best. You still might have to face some circumstances and consequences, but you know what? Jesus can make it okay. Jesus can write those wrongs. Jesus can take a mess and make a message. Jesus can repair the brokenhearted. Jesus can repair your marriage, but he wants to work and repair you first. And so what happens here? Jesus is on the scene. He's going down to Capernaum in a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he begins to teach the people. What does he do? He goes into the synagogue. A few verses before that, we see Jesus going into the synagogue and preaching with power. 
why, why does the Bible tell us this? It's because back in the day, rabbis would just walk into synagogues and they would teach the law to people. They would quote Rabbi Zechariah or Rabbi Daniel and say all these eloquent things that these rabbis would speak of and they would recite laws and talk about washing the outside of the cup before you drink to make sure you're ceremoniously clean and they would talk about how to fold your napkins and how to plow your your field straight. They would talk about all these laws of washing and purification. They would bore the people to death. It was all laws. There was no spirit of God. It was all rules and regulations, deep theology, but no application, no spirit of God, no life. They were bored to death in these churches. And so you can understand why there is a demon-possessed individual in the church because there's been no power of God's word taught. There's been no power of God's word spoken. And it's the power of God's word. It is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto to salvation. For those who would believe, first the Jew and then the Gentile, it's the gospel message that is the power of God that frees people from their sins and from the grips of the enemy. And for all these years, the synagogues were just teaching law after law. If you're in a dead church today, if you're in a church where you walk away knowing more about superlapsarianism and eschatology and theology and you never hear the gracious good news of the gospel of Jesus and you're never able to apply anything that you've heard in the pulpit to everyday life, it doesn't bring you any hope. It doesn't make you any more like Jesus. It just makes you more like the Encyclopedia Britannica filled with more and more knowledge which puffs up and you walk out going, man, that was a great sermon. Didn't understand a word the guy said. But man, he is so smart. He's way over my head. If that's how your church is, I encourage you, find a church that preaches and teaches the word of God on your level with the transforming power of the spirit of God behind it. That's where life is. That's what I went to every weekend back in Knoxville, Tennessee. I hungered for the truth of God's word, not some definition of a theological term or what so-and-so theologian said over. I didn't want to have regurgitated commentary. I wanted to hear from the living word, from the living God, that he would intersect my life and know and, and, and show his love to me by giving me the truth that I needed to hear for the situation I was in. And God is that personal. He will, if you get in the presence of him and draw near to him, he will draw near to you and give you the very word that you need to hear that will minister to your soul, that will minister to your situation. But you got to get in the place where you can hear the word of God. And so it's imperative that we understand that Jesus went in and he taught with authority and power. He came with the word of God, not just what so-and-so rabbi dry as dust from the desert began to speak. He came and spoke the very word of God. And people were at awe because he spoke with such authority and power because that's the only word that has such life-giving authority and kingdom power. It's the word of God. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is now leaving a synagogue teaching. He's coming down to a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he begins to teach the people. Verse 32. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. Authority. Man, if you're not listening to the word of God, there is no authority in your life. If you're listening to what CNN says, MSNBC, Fox News, if you're listening to what your neighbor says for, for direction in your life or for, for help in the situation that has got you so hopeless, if you're looking for hope in everything else but the Word of God, there is no authority in what Cosmopolitan or Newsweek tells you. There might be law, there might be direction, but there is no life-changing authority other than in the Word of God. And so we need to be connected to a people that follow the Word of God, that take in the Word of God, that meditate on the Word of God, and that put into practice the Word of God. I just had a conversation with my family the other day. I said, it does us no good to know and quote scriptures left and right and not live them out and not allow God to make it part of us 
to where we become that scripture. And when we come into a situation where that scripture is applicable, we use it. We've got to use it. We can't just know it and walk away and close our Bibles and expect life to be different or to expect to live the abundant life that God has for us. Now, Jesus spoke with authority. Jesus didn't scream and slam things down. Jesus just spoke eloquently from the word, from the logos. And the excitement and the passion that was received through the word of God wasn't because of the way he acted. It was because what he was speaking was truth. And it had authority behind it. It had the power of God behind it. The Spirit of God would use the Word of God to interact with you and change and transform your life. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Not by flesh, but by the Spirit of God. This all works together. If you're expecting victory or help over a hurt, by not reading the word of God and allowing it to be used by the spirit of God in you, there is no hope for you. You've got to understand. Those of you who have found yourselves in situations where it seems hopeless, first you need to get it out into the light where God can operate with you and you can see the truth of your error, but God can begin to show you by walking in the light, walking underneath the light of the word of God, he can begin to show you what needs to go and what he's going to put in. And he gives you the word for the day that will help you throughout the day's journey as you battle this world that we live in. It does us no good just to know it and walk away from it. It's like a man looking in the mirror, walking away, forgetting who he was. You don't do that. You look into the word of God intently and you allow it to be applied to your life situations as God brings them to your awareness by the conviction of the spirit. You apply the word of God. Jesus goes into the synagogue and the people are enamored by the power of his word. There is power in the word of God. Again, like I said, it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, I am not ashamed of the gospel as, as Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who would believe, first the Jew and then the Gentile. The question is, do you believe the word of God that you read? Do you believe that there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Do you believe that without holiness, be ye holy as I am holy, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Those were scriptures that God began to give me when I was living in sin. He began to tell me, look, be ye holy as I'm holy, because without holiness, no one will see that means you. You have to be separate from this world. You cannot be tainted with sin. And then God would bring like 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to me. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Look, I've rescued you from these, Jesus says to us. <laughs> I've rescued you from, you used to be that way. Don't be deceived by it. Don't go back to it. Don't try to justify it. Don't try to rationalize and live in this sin because do not be deceived. None of these people that are modeled where their life is modeled after these uh, descriptive words will ever enter the kingdom of God. Those are some, some verses that'll, that'll shake a man in sin or a woman in sin. I tell you what, I cannot justify my sin enough to overcome the truth of what God's word says. I cannot stand and argue my case in front of God for why I lived in sin over and over again and expect him to just say, well, okay, that's a great story. I forgot to put that clause in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But except for Drew, who can justify his sin better than anybody, he can come into heaven. No. No one that lives this way will never see the kingdom of God. Why? Because they've never been changed. They've never been redeemed. They've never been saved. And so they live this way. Though they may look on the outside like a sheep, they're really a wolf in sheep's clothing. So do not deceive ourselves. 
we have to get in front of the power of God's word because that's where hope begins. And Jesus is in the synagogue and the people are amazed that he preaches with authority. And it says in verse 33, in the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. Now here, this man is in an evil spirit and therefore he's possessed by this evil spirit. What does that mean? It means that this man so chose to live around things and do things that were sinful. He wanted to have his way with darkness. And before you know it, he found himself way too involved in sin. So he was in sin, which invited the enemy into his own life. And he was overcome by the sinful tendencies that the enemy brings our ways when we dabble constantly in sin. Before you know it, you fall head over heels into sin and you are now not just in sin, but you are consumed by the enemy and he inhabits you and he drives you and he possesses your actions, your attitudes and your desires. He is driving you and oppressing you with sinful tendencies. This man was so consumed by the enemy that he wasn't even in control anymore. All he could do was say yes to sin. The enemy was operating through him. And this man no longer could say no. It was game on every time this certain sin would come. And I wonder how many of us are that way in our attitudes, our actions, our, our, our words, our thoughts. How many of you have dabbled on the edge of sin so long that now you find yourself so consumed by it you can't get the enemy out of your house and he's overtaking you and you've been caught? And so what do you do? You hide out. And that's what this man is doing. He's hiding out. But he's in church. He's hiding out and he's in church. Isn't that crazy that the enemy can hide out in church? That's how dead this church was. That a man possessed by an evil spirit, whitewashed with the smile of everything is okay, was hiding in the pews, hiding in the, in the crowd of people in the church, hurting, helpless and hopeless, but was still allowed to be there, never receiving the hope that he needed from the word of God because no one was teaching it. And he sure as heck wasn't going to stand up and say, you know what, I'm having an affair, I'm into pornography, I beat my wife, my children hate me because I don't feel... He wasn't going to do those things. So he hid behind the self-righteous mask. But week after week, day after day, he was in church, a dead church that couldn't even discern that he was there, probably because they were all in the same situation. They were all hurting and hopeless because they hadn't heard the word of God. Nothing was spoken with authority because all they did was talk about laws and theology and religion and, you know, do this and don't do that, the Christmas list of Christianity. And here are hurting people in the church, and it breaks Jesus' heart to know that there are hurting people that aren't receiving the word of God. God which will free them if you're my disciples you'll know my word you'll obey it and the truth will set you free and if you're free if you're in Jesus the son will set you free and you'll be free indeed the Bible says why is that not working because many of us aren't hearing the word of God let alone getting in the word of God so I'm encouraging you today, if you're hurting, there is hope for the hurting. It's found in the presence and in the word of Jesus. This man was hiding out in the synagogue. And Jesus coming into the synagogue, preaching with authority, now confronts the enemy. Just the presence of light, just the presence of righteousness and the word of God spoken with authority brings to account evil. It must bow down to the light. And that's why the Bible tells us, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Have nothing to do with them, but yet rather expose them. Expose them, bring them into the light. And you may have been exposed, unbeknownst to you, something came out and maybe your life's falling apart. Know that that is the love of God because God does not desire that you walk in sin for the rest of your life, thus missing out on the kingdom of God, not being sure if you're saved. God wants to shake you and wake you with the powerful word of God and bring your sins into the light that you could deal with them and get through them and get over them and become a message instead of a mess 
and then begin to minister to other people as your life is put back together. Jesus wants to be known in the community and across the world. And as he changes one life at a time that's willing to speak about the things that God has delivered them from, he is magnified and known. And people want to know, who is this Jesus? This is how it works, folks. There is hope for the hurting. So Jesus goes in and there's this man that's possessed with a demon, an evil spirit. He cries out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Even the demons understand who Jesus is. Jesus just got done dealing with their daddy, the devil, in the desert. And so word's probably gotten around to the, the, to the, the demon family that, you know what, Jesus is on the scene and he is victorious. There's no more sting in death. There's no more sting in sin. And Jesus is the healer. He's the forgiver. He is the one that brings hope. And so they know, hey, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And here's the thing. Jesus doesn't even answer them. He says, they say, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What do you want with us? Jesus wants absolutely nothing to do with the demonic world. Jesus wants nothing to do. That's how diametrically opposed they are. They can't coexist together. I want nothing to do with you, but you to leave and evacuate yourself from my presence because just the very fact that we are in the same proximity is not right. What does unrighteousness, or what does righteousness have to do with unrighteousness? Nothing. What does light have to do with darkness? Nothing. You know, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, don't be unequally yoked with others you know don't be yoked together with an unbeliever what do righteousness and wickedness have in common nothing or what fellowship can light have with darkness zero what harmony is there between christ and belial what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever what do you want to do with us what do you want with us he wants nothing to do with wickedness and darkness. And so Jesus is going to rid this man of the darkness that is within him. That's how much Christ cares about you. He is willing to heal you and to repair your life and take the darkness and the enemy out of your life and cast it as far as the east is from the west <laughs> because he wants nothing of darkness to be in his children. And if we are his child and we found ourselves in some kind of sin and God's brought it to the light, you may feel shame, you may feel humiliation, but know this, that's not from the Lord. That's the effects of sin in your life. But God comes to restore you and to give you life and freedom and forgiveness and unconditional love. He wants to wash your sin white as snow. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sin is like scarlet, it will be as white as snow, right? Though it's like crimson, it'll be as wool. God wants to wash your sins away. And that's why he tells you when you know you're in sin, don't let it pile up. Don't let it be all-consuming to where now the enemy is ruling your life as my child. Confess it, 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sin. Agree with me that what you're doing is wrong and sinful. And I am faithful. I will forgive you of your sin and purify you from all unrighteousness. All those other sins that you haven't even confessed as you're a confessional person and confess the known sin that you have in your life, I'll wash all the other effects of all the other sins you don't even remember out of your life and make you white as snow. Jesus wants nothing to do with these demonic influences that know who he is. We know you are the Holy One of God. Jesus says, in, in a sense, he says, shut up. Don't you give me just a verbal assent of who I am. I am not looking for you to propagate who I am to this world because your confession of me is not from the heart. It's just a head knowledge and it means nothing. It doesn't draw people in. It doesn't save people. You will never be saved even though you as a demon know who I am. You don't truly understand and know in, my, in your heart who I am because you can never be transformed. God's people can be. 
lost people can be. We, they can be saved and transformed and regenerate in their heart and spiritually born again, and they can confess Jesus as Lord. That is a testimony not just of the mind or the mouth. It's of the heart. It's a total transformation. It's salvation. That's the kind of testimony that God wants about himself through his people who have been transformed, not from a devil who can say, I know who that is. That's Jesus, but they live as the enemy lives in sin and debauchery and filth. A lot of people do that. And that brings disgrace to the Lord that they claim to be a Christian. They claim to know who Jesus is, but they live like the devil himself. Jesus doesn't want that testimony. He wants valid testimonies of transformed lives by the power of God working in them. Amen. So Jesus comes in and confronts this, this, uh, this demon. And I find it interesting. He tells them to, to be quiet. He see, in a sense, he says, be muzzled. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Why don't people want to get in front of Jesus who are in sin? Because it is going to be painful. It's going to be painful to come before the light, that things might be exposed, that, that bring um, other people to question and judge your life. Now your sin's out in the open. It might hurt you a little bit. Here's the thing. But the only thing that can get the demon out of your life is the one that's overcome death, hell, and the grave and who has authority over the devil. God has authority over the devil. God has authority to tell the demons what to do and they have to submit to him and his word. Jesus doesn't write a letter. He speaks the word, come out of him. He speaks the word of hope to this man and the demons have to come out. But it's not going to always be an easy road. There's going to be a little bit of pain involved, but Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one that will bandage your wounds up. He'll pour a little oil on those wounds. He'll bandage you up and he'll pay your tab. Jesus is in the business of rescuing and redeeming and being the hope and the physician of love to his people so that they can have the hope in their hurting time of need. Come out of him, Jesus says, and the devil's demons have no other response to do but come out because Jesus is the authoritative word. And this man is convulsed. And here's the truth. The devil doesn't care about using and abusing you. He hopes that you allow him into your life to shatter it. He's going to promise you all kinds of good things on the front end. It's called sin. And sin always looks good on the front end until you get head over heels in it. And it's cost you your life. It's cost you your wife. It's cost you your family. It's cost you all that's in your bank account. It's robbed you of time. Forty years have gone by and you're still tangled. But now it's come out. The enemy would love to shatter your world and he will convulse you because he doesn't care about you. This demon comes out convulsing this man to the floor in the presence of all these people. What does it show? It shows that Jesus has authority over these demons. It shows that these demons don't care about how they use and abuse you and your body. They're just looking for a host to continue to do sin and lead God's people astray. But it also shows that this is a wake-up call. This is a, a time where it might be painful to let go of sin. Some of us are so entrenched in sin that it's painful to put down the pornography. It's painful to tame our tongue. It's painful to treat people kindly, but it's the best thing for you. And look what happens. This man, the demons are exercised out of him by the power of the word of Jesus Christ. And this man is demon-free. And it says they, come, they came out without injuring him oh it's funny that the enemy wants you to know that it's going to be such a hard road to get clean it's going to be such a hard road to get right but with jesus on the scene jesus will bring those demons out you might have to pay some consequences of your sin but i guarantee you when it's all over you're gonna be all right, because there is hope for the hurting. No matter what you're facing today, no matter what you are going through, Jesus wants you to know, endure it. Endure it with me, and it's going to be all right. You're going to get up demon-free, forgiven, washed clean, and it's going to be all right. But you've got to stay the course. You've got to stay the course. You've got to stay in my presence. You've got to stay in the presence of the word, hearing the life-transforming power of the word. Jesus says it is going to be all right. This man gets up without being injured. And all the people were amazed 
And they said to each other, what is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to the evil spirits and they come out. And check this out. Verse 37. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding areas. That's the kind of testimony that God wants from his people who are redeemed and changed. He wants us to wake up in these pews. Listen to the hope that's in the word of God because there are those of us who are hurting. Though we're sitting in church all day long around people who are not willing to be real. You know, it's a high time that the church have a real testimony time where, where people get up and say, you know what, I was in this sin, but God delivered me. I was doing this, but God delivered me. My family and my marriage were on the rocks, but God delivered me. We need not just to hear that testimony in the church. We need to take that testimony out and say, God has delivered me from this. That's the testimony that God wants the world to know that he is alive and well and he is Lord and Savior and he is able to rip any demonic influence from people that are lost and entangled in the world. He can free them and forgive them if they just hear the word of God and respond to it in faith. And for those of us who are children of God who have found ourselves in so much sin that we don't think that there's a way out and that there's no light at the end of the tunnel, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus, he, all he asks is that you repent. What shall we do to be saved? Repent. What shall I do as a child of God that's in sin? 1 John 1, 9, confess it. Agree with me, it's sin. And I'm faithful. And just, I'll forgive you of that sin. Piece of cake. And I'll wash all the unrighteousness away. God loves you that much. But you've got to get in the presence of Jesus in his word. You've got to listen to it and apply it to your life. I remember back in 1999, 2000-ish, I was walking in a field. I was in seminary, and I was dealing with lustful thoughts. And I was walking in a field, screaming and crying out to the Lord, take this from me. Take this from me. I was walking, reading my Bible, reading about how I was to be pure and how God could deliver me. God didn't come to condemn me, but I was already condemned. I gave my life fully and completely to the Lord that day. He washed all that sin away. How did he do it? He brought my sin into the light. <laughs> he made me deal with it. That's how much he loved me. He loved me enough to say, look, I'm going to show myself so real to you, but you're going to have to endure it. But know this. When the course of it coming out into the light and you confessing it, and you repenting, and you being broken of it, through that pain that you'll experience personally, know that I'm walking with you as the Good Shepherd, the loving Father. I am bringing you out of the darkness that has overtaken you. I am pulling out the demonic influence in your life. Hand in hand, we are walking this journey. Stay the course because you're gonna come out all right and unharmed. And sure enough, Within a matter of weeks, my sin was exposed. I had to confront it. I had to deal with it. But God walked me through that season of life. And today, it is all right. Why? Because back then, Jesus showed me. It's going to be all right. You're going to come out of this victorious and with the hope that you need. And you will be unharmed. And I have been free from that demonic influence for the past 20 some years folks amen amen it's for you as well there is hope for the hurting and so i pray today that you would understand that god wants to make your life a testimony to validate who he is and to show other people how good and faithful our lord is if you're hurting today and you found yourself in a sin could you imagine what your life would be like if you just got in the word of god and obeyed it let God deal with the demons. Let God rebuke the devil in your life and pull him out of your life. It might be revealing. It might be a little shaking. But the Bible says you're going to be unharmed. And you're going to be better on the other side. That's the beautiful thing. This guy probably would have never thought that he would come out of this process unharmed. So the enemy flooded him with fear 
Fear to keep him in the darkness. Fear to keep him hiding out in the church, not listening to the word of God, not desiring to, to get in the presence of Jesus and the word and the light. He kept him in the darkness because he probably told him over and over again, this is going to destroy your life. It's going to destroy your family. It's going to destroy. Sure, there are consequences. But Jesus says, with him, you're going to come out unharmed. Unharmed. That is the love of Jesus. Oh, brings chills to my body. Well, I pray that you were blessed. I pray that you would realize the hope for the hurting is in the Word of God. What would your life be like if you just obeyed today? I have no idea, but I can guarantee you it will be drastically different than it was yesterday or three weeks ago. Folks, as the body of Christ, if we just implemented the Word of God and allowed the Lord Jesus to reveal to us what we are doing in the darkness and if we walked into the light as he is in the light he would transform your life he can repair any mess that you've made there's nothing beyond god that he cannot fix he is the lord of all creation he creates something even out of nothing that's how powerful the lord is spoke all this into existence he can speak life into your situation I pray that you have decided to follow Jesus. It's by simple faith. You trust him as your Lord and Savior, and you ask him to forgive you of your sins, and then you live for him as a transformed individual, a new creation in Christ. Today, if you've given your life to Jesus, I pray that you would send us an email. Email one of the pastors or call the church and just say, you know what, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus today, and we will be blessed, and we will pray for you, and we will get in touch with you that we can minister to you and rejoice with your entrance into the kingdom of God. May you have a blessed Sunday afternoon. God bless you. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this opportunity just to hear the truth. God, I pray that you are setting people free today. Lord, show them that there is hope for the hurting. And God, may you be the testimony on our lips in this community that other people may know that Jesus is alive and well and he is interested in healing the brokenhearted. He is interested in giving hope to the hurting. Father, use us as a testimony to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Take care.